We don't think of the mace that stands next to the Speaker of the House as having any kind of real force. It's just a symbol, right? But at least one occasion, it had to be presented as a weapon in order to calm the members of the United States House of Representatives. So after Zachary Taylor's election in 1849, upon the conclusion of the Mexican War, there's a debate over what to do with the new territories. You're going to allow slavery in these areas, California, New Mexico, or not. In the election, the Democrats lead. So you have 112 Democrats in the House, 105 Whigs in the House, and 13 Free Soilers in the House. There's a lot of new members. 11 people put in a bid to run for Speaker. Democrats split their votes. Whigs split their votes. Most of the Democrats are backing a guy, Hal Cobb of Georgia. Most of the Whigs are backing an anti-slavery candidate, Robert Winthrop. In the absence of a Speaker, the clerk presides. And usually this is only for a matter of minutes. He ends up having to preside over the House for weeks. He can't keep order. No one really listens to his authority. He's constantly banging the gavel. At one time, a Virginian who's running for speaker is accused by another member, a member from New York, that he's a disunionist. The Virginian says, that is false. And the New Yorker says, you are a liar. The Virginian charges at him, swinging. Friends get in between the two House members, and initially they've got to calm down, except once the friends jump in, other members of the House from either side start jumping in, and there's an absolute melee. As the Sergeant of Arms said, had a bomb exploded in the House of Representatives, there could not have been more excitement. Members are struggling, screaming. And at this point, the sergeant in arms picks up the mace of the House of Representatives and puts himself square in the middle of the crowd. He doesn't swing. But this gesture from the sergeant of arms provokes some surprise. There's actually a few jeers, a few laughs. A few people are like, that mace has no authority in the House. But it generally calms the crowd down. There are 59 attempts, 59 ballots, to elect a speaker. There's never a majority. Finally, a member from Tennessee raises his hand and said, Look, we know we need a majority to elect a speaker. We don't have a majority. Let's do three more votes. And if we can't agree after three more votes, can we agree that the plurality will hold? And the members are tired at this point. Three more votes occur. And on the 63rd ballot, Hal Cobb of Georgia is picked as speaker. Well, as we round out the year here, let's do a hodgepodge of some uh, listener questions that I've gotten at the Facebook Fans of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics site and also at Quora.com. David Kenny writes on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics Facebook site, I noticed that there is at least some movement from the conservative side of the Republican Party to replace House Speaker John Boehner was some other candidate, presumably one more conservative and less willing to work with the president. I was wondering, has the party in control of the House ever been so split that they were not able to get the needed majority to name a speaker? It generally doesn't happen in modern times. I'm not thinking of any examples in the 20th century. Okay, so if you look going back at speakers uh, from the current one, Boehner, Pelosi, Hastert, Gingrich, Foley, Wright, Tip O'Neill, Carl Albert, John McCormick, Sam Rayburn, Joseph Martin, Rayburn again, Joseph Martin, Rayburn again, Bankhead, Burns, Rainey, Garner, Longworth, Gillett, Champ Clark, Cannon, and Henderson. That takes you all the way to 1899, McKinley's presidency. And you have all the speakers of the House, I would say, elected as part of that normal process. The party in power pick them all. There was no special coalitions or anything like that. Now, in 1910, progressive Republicans and regular Democrats 
were able to join forces and build a 191 vote coalition to reduce the power of the Republican Speaker Joe Cannon. He still remained as Speaker, but as he said in his own words, he was dead as a doornail. GOP would end up losing the House in that 1910 election. Joe Cannon would lose his own seat in 1912 and go from this really powerful Speaker to losing really control of the House. And that coalition was temporary, though. There's another incident in 1855 where you have 133 ballots before they can pick a Speaker. Now, this is in the time after the Kansas-Nebraska Act is passed, and you have an election where you've got the new Republican Party in its first run, there's 108 Republicans elected to the House. Now, some of these are called anti-Kansas-Nebraskans, and not everyone's using the Republican label yet. 43 Know-Nothings, or American Party, this is the anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic party, get in, and 83 Democrats. It takes them 133 ballots to pick a speaker, during which time the clerk presides and they finally do, and a know-nothing candidate from Massachusetts, Nathaniel Banks, becomes speaker. So, very rare that these type of coalitions that you're talking about happen. Usually, speakers are elected, straight party votes, and that's kind of true of the 20th century and the 19th century. So I would expect a similar battle royale in the House at this time. There's a partisan tinge to speaker votes. It would be a great disgrace for a group of people in a party to work with the other party in getting a speaker elected because the speaker has so much influence on what then goes on, who's on the rule committee, etc. So you have to remember that any kind of coalition, it would not just be for a single speaker vote. They'd have to stay together on each vote or else you're going to have an extremely weak speaker. So if this were to happen with Boehner, where he somehow miraculously was able to get you know, 50 Democratic votes to go along with him. He's going to have to keep that coalition intact and run the House with that coalition, all right? There's no going back. What kind of a republic is it, after all, when one of just three family names will be involved on the winning ticket for the last 40 years? Bush, Clinton, and Obama. This will concern voters, and I think it will be discussed. So here's the question. Will fears of a family political dynasty be a concern for voters if Jeb Bush runs for president? Should they be? If it's a concern, how should Governor Bush address it? Okay, it will be a concern, and it's going to be discussed. It already is discussed. But it shouldn't be a serious problem for Jeb Bush running in a general election, especially because the current frontrunner, at least in the whisper primary for the Democratic nomination, is Hillary Clinton, the same name that had been president in two presidential elections, and she ran for president herself. It'll cancel out the issue because she'll have a general election of two dynasties. I mean, it'll be much in the same way as in 2008, we knew we were getting a sitting senator. Now, normally... A sitting senator in U.S. politics has a disadvantage. Kennedy, before him, you had Harding, and that was it. And there are big gaps between those. But in 2008, you knew you were getting a sitting senator, so you know there was no way to compare the issue and to say, who would it be an advantage for? There are two people that American voters tend to vote for for president, incumbent presidents and governors. Everybody else has a little disadvantage. I think it's a concern uh, that Jeb Bush will have to overcome in those Republican primaries. But I also think the benefits outweigh the minuses for him. Eight years of a hostile presidency, and I'm speaking from the Republican primary voters' thinking point of view here, may make anyone associated with Bush or from the Bush administration look fine by the time we get to 2016. Now, in 2008... That might have been a different story. Even among Republicans, there was some unpopularity there and feeling that the Bush administration wasn't running things right. A president appoints a lot of people, all of those U.S. attorneys, all the leaders of his cabinet, all of those executive departments. 
Those are people who are going to remember and they're going to be very helpful in the primary process. You know, they don't all disappear. They're in state, local, and federal offices right now. Or they're involved within party organizations. So it, you might say that if one looks just at the establishment side of the Republicans and not kind of the grassroots sides, the Bushes would be the only core or center to that group. So he's actually in an interesting position. Now, how would Governor Bush address this? Well, you know, it's my history, you can beat up your politics, and I'm not a political consultant, but every once in a while I can put the hat on and give a little free advice. I think it's easy to me. It's his clear goal is not going to be affected by who he is in that way. It would be to own that brand. He wants to make sure he is the establishment choice in those primaries. And what he's going to hope for is there is at least two and maybe three grassroots or Tea Party Republican favorites entering the presidential primary so that he can win the nomination with a small percentage vote in the states that he needs to by splitting the other side. The other thing to keep in mind, the Republican Party will decide its nominee in a convention. At that convention, the entire United States of America will be represented. So in other words, there will be a Republican delegation from Rhode Island. There will be a Republican delegation from New York. There will be a Republican delegation from New Jersey. In fact, because of their rules, the New Jersey delegation will be enhanced because they have a governor. So states that don't normally vote for Republicans in presidential elections, even those that haven't done it in 20 or more years, will still be picking that nominee. And so a moderate or establishment Republican candidate is going to try to win all the primaries in those states and be competitive elsewhere. Are they going is Jeb Bush going to win South Carolina? Not likely. Possible, but not likely. And if he wins that, you know he's steamroller in the thing. However, New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Delaware, Hawaii, all those blue states that are going to send delegates to Cleveland to pick the Republican nominee, they're going to be a factor. Now, the Republican Party also has mechanisms in place, which the Democratic Party does not, that reward states that have a Republican governor, that have a Republican legislature. They try to offset that rotten borough, if you will, effect where a blue state is essentially going to pick the red party's nominee. But that only has an impact. The, the reality is there's still lots of delegates from blue states that the more establishment Republican is going to do quite well in. Okay, this is an interesting question because I think the way it's being phrased this is a question on Quora and by the person who wrote it is from the point of view of a conservative. A while ago, I read a bio of FDR. In the book, he said that FDR was adamant about people working if they were getting government handouts. Is it true that FDR was passionate about requiring some form of work from people who received money from the government? The fact is, the question asker is, is right. You know, the answer is yes, but the reasoning behind it is probably different from what they would want to impart from the answer. Let me explain. It is true to say that not only Franklin Roosevelt, but his main administrator, Harry Hopkins, this is the guy that he delegated most of the aid work to, the WPA, the CWA, the relief programs. They all felt that dignity required work. The program, CWA, WPA, their major components of the New Deal both involved relief money with some amount of work. Not only did Hopkins, and including FDR, feel that it would be better for the recipient, they figured that the larger society would benefit from the work so that you'd have bridges constructed, you'd have parks uh, cleaned out, trees cut down, in some cases, plays put on and books and novels written. There are many areas of the country where work performed in the 1930s still stands. The idea of work rather than relief was aligned with cultural norms at the time. There were some unemployed at that time who would not receive a handout. They wouldn't take it. Now, 
be careful with insisting on this as a hard line. In other words, the New Deal didn't give any money unless the person did work in bet- as, as well. It's not true to say that they insisted on it. They had programs that involved work, and that was the goal, and they ran into a few problems, which I'll discuss in a bit. But they also had programs that involved direct relief, and an awful lot of money was spent on direct relief. There are a couple issues that they ran up against with WPA and the other work programs. And one is that they did not want to compete with private industry as it was developing. So in, for one thing, no construction work. You know, housing construction, building construction for private buildings, apartment buildings and the like, that had to be private industry. Otherwise, you felt they would be in competition with the government. And that's something that if you hear now anytime there's a government program enacted and it's sort of presented like they didn't think about that in the 1930s. They absolutely did. They're very concerned with competing. So all of the WPA and the, the, the smaller PWA programs were public buildings, roads, parks, schools, bridges, They very sheepishly got into the textile business, mostly for uniforms, for public servants, and for those who absolutely, you know, the needy that absolutely needed clothing. So they did hire a number of women to do in the garment industry. But that was an area of the program where they kept a careful eye on it and reduced the program as time went on so as not to stop the textile industry from getting back. There's a couple things to note here. One is, there is a little bit of the culture of that time. People lived, uh, in, in a lot of cases, people were concentrated. Either, you know, there was a, the, the population of New York City held a great population, a great percentage of the American people. And so the, the population was centered around certain urban areas. You didn't have things like suburbs where people were far from the dense city centers. It's a little harder to do these type of work programs today. For one, skills are so specialized. And another is that, another reason is that there are only so many people who can do the type of manual labor that you might have done back in the 1930s that a government public service would require. So construction, working on roads, I mean, there was a few side jobs. It'd be a lot harder to do that today. People don't simply do not possess the manual skills that your average person in the 1930s did. There's some simple work that still can be done manually. Some have been, has been replaced by machines. So instead of sweeping a street, you have street cleaners and things like this. You know, it's just more effective. We live in very distant areas from each other, so it's hard to get to the area where the work would be. If anything, you know, unemployment has made advances in people being able to apply through the telephone or through any number of centers instead of having to go to one place in all cases, in all states. We see these as advancements. So the other thing to consider is that the Great Depression involved a good number of able-bodied men being unemployed at one time. So when we're talking about FDR requiring work and Harry Hopkins requiring work, those are the people they're thinking of. They're not thinking about, for instance, mothers with children. Although there were some WPA programs, as we mentioned, for women. So to to apply that now and to say that, oh, there shouldn't be a work program for those who have children, I mean, that wouldn't be in the keeping in the spirit of the Roosevelt administration as the question asker would like. How would Reconstruction have happened if Lincoln had not been assassinated? Well, for this, I would look at Lincoln's letter to General Weitzel upon the fall of Richmond. If I were in your place, he said, I'd let him up easy. Almost all evidence points to a supposition that Lincoln would have preferred an easier Reconstruction and would have hurried to get states back into the Union. We know that. Here's why we don't know two things. One, if Lincoln would have felt the same after all the guns were silenced everywhere. And two, if we as moderns would have liked what Lincoln did. 
But in order to suppose what he might have done, we could look at two actions. One is his plans for the reconstruction of Louisiana, and the other is his veto, pocket veto, of the Wade Davis bill. These are clues for what his vision was. Lincoln issues a proclamation, December 1863, that argued for a low standard for Reconstruction to bring states back as quickly as possible. Under Lincoln's plan, all that's needed is for 10% of the white citizens of the state to say an oath and for the state to ban slavery. This happens very quickly in Louisiana. All right. When Louisiana is occupied, white Southerners meet in 1864. They have a convention. They draft a new constitution. They get 10% to say the oath. Louisiana has, especially in the city of New Orleans, a very educated elite, good number of transplants from northern states. It was not a pro-secession area during that decision. So they have some people who can administer the state after Reconstruction, They're, and they meet, promising free public schooling, improvements to labor, public works projects. They abolish slavery in the state. They would not give free slaves the right to vote. So although Lincoln approved the Louisiana Constitution, in, in accordance with his plan, Congress doesn't like it. The Wade Davis bill is passed. It requires a majority of white citizens, not 10%, to swear allegiance for Reconstruction to happen. Now, for some states, that's never going to happen. It might have been an impossible Reconstruction plan. I mean, one imagines Georgia after Sherman's march to get a majority. If a majority could not be had, Wade Davis provided for the appointment of provisional military governors in the seceded states until a state could get a majority. If a majority of states White citizens did swear allegiance to the Union. A constitutional convention would be called. Each state had to abolish slavery, repudiate secession, disqualify Confederate officials from voting or holding office. In order to vote, a person would be required to take an out that he had never voluntarily given aid to the Confederacy. You have two very different plans there. Lincoln's obviously is simple He's actually going to look to people who might have just been in a Confederate uniform to now repair the state, bring it back into the Union, ban slavery, and let's get back to being one country. The congressional plan is aimed at having military governors in place for a little bit more time and to essentially run the states with the very slim minority of those in the South that might have never cooperated with the Confederate Army. Lincoln pocket vetoes Wade Davis. That means he let it die without signing because it was during a recess. But he issues a message as well. Here's what he says. Whereas at the late session, Congress passed a bill to guarantee certain states whose government have been usurped or overthrown, a Republican form of government, a copy of which is here on to annexed. And whereas the said bill contains, among other things, a plan for restoring the states in rebellion to their proper practical relation to the Union, now, therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, do proclaim, declare, and make it known that, while I am unprepared by a formal approval of this bill to be inflexibly committed to any single plan of restoration, and while I am also unprepared to declare the free state constitutions and government already adopted and installed in Arkansas and Louisiana shall be set aside and held for naught, thereby repelling and discovering the loyal citizens who have set up the same, nevertheless, I am fully satisfied with a system for restoration contained in the bill as one very proper plan for the loyal people of any state choosing to adopt it, and that I am, and at all times shall be prepared, to give executive aid and assistance to any such people, as soon as the military resistance to the United States shall have been suppressed in any such state. He goes on. In that message, he's hinting that he'd rather see states work it out for themselves, and he'd rather have a case-by-case -case reconstruction. So, there's answers in that message. Obviously, he didn't approve of the congressional plan, though he said he might accept it in one state. If there was a state that could produce a majority, you get some hints about what he might have done. But he also is careful not to even insist on his own proclamation as the right one. He's basically saying... I'm not signing Wade Davis. I'm not going to be tied to any one plan. 
you have answers and you have more questions. I think there are two great questions. When he issued the proclamation in 1863, the war was raging still. Gettysburg and Vicksburg had happened, but Atlanta had not yet. His total focus, expounded at many times, was to win the war, bring the Union back. Could we interpret that, for instance, in the Louisiana Proclamation, in the acceptance of that Constitution? He was merely giving sweet treatment to the early cave-ins, just like anyone in a negotiation might. You know, if you have some striking workers and a couple are going to cross the line, you might give them a really good treatment to get them. Is that going to be the same treatment you give to the other states in the rebellion? Particularly, look at the political problem. You know, Louisiana is not where the Civil War started. Arkansas is not where the Civil War started. These are fringe states that joined the Confederacy, had a lot of Unionists in their midst. In the case of Arkansas, the fighting never stopped. It was always an area of battle between the two sides. There was never a consistent Confederate government there. So the politics of offering that type of support for Louisiana and Arkansas's constitution are going to change, I think, when you get into South Carolina seen as the instigator of the Civil War in the North, and Virginia, where Robert Lee's from, and one of the key battlegrounds, and seen as the powerhouse behind the Confederacy and where the capital is. Are you going to be able to treat those states the same? They would Lincoln have? We know he'd do a little better than Congress in that way. We, we know he'd be more keen to get these states back into the Union than Congress, but I can't say he'd offer that same plan. So we don't know. That's a question to consider. Secondly, would Lincoln's Reconstruction have fared any better? And by that I mean in the way that we moderns look at things. Would these 10% governments have been able to keep order? Would they have been able to restore rights? We as modern would have liked it if they did. When would voting rights have been obtained by black citizens under the governments? Would it haven't happened any faster under the Lincoln Reconstruction, then under the Radical Reconstruction, and then the Presidential Reconstruction, and Jim Crow laws that all that followed in history. There's no easy answer to this, as there never is in all history, but there are questions to consider. The Reconstruction plan that happened, and the series of events that happened in the 19th century in the South, we look at, as most look at as moderns, is not successful. Would they have been any more successful? with a different approach. And we simply don't know. You hear often that the Civil War wasn't about slavery. I do note that in both of those Reconstruction plans, whether you're a Lincoln moderate or a radical Republican, both insisted on that. Slavery had to absolutely be banned for a state to come into the Union. Now, if it wasn't a part of the original conflict... It was the defining issue of both power bases in the North as to what they would agree on to end the conflict. What's the definitive book on the Spanish-American War? Well, for books on what would have been largely called the Spanish War in its time, I don't have a single book to recommend. I often don't read books like that. Like, I I won't normally just pick up a book on the American Revolution or a book on the Civil War like that, a total book. I often find those type of books are where narratives and agendas creep up more. I'd rather read diagonally. And that is to say, reading books that have elements of the subject you want, where their primary goal is to discuss something else. So it's a good way to avoid agendas and get the real scene of history at the time because people are giving you facts without even knowing they're doing it. You know, So if you take this kind of cocktail approach on a subject on, you'll come up with a good rounded knowledge, and it works with the Spanish War. It was bloodier and riskier than most accounts give. It was an ugly war that involved trenches and machine guns and horrible disease. Ten times as many men killed by tropical diseases and the lack of preparation for them, than by combat. This was true in Cuba, but particularly in the total campaign in the Philippines, which really lasted four years, when you count the rebellion that sprung up after we 
accepted control from the Spanish. So if you want an almost minute-by-minute -minute description of the Battle of San Juan Hill, I'd recommend the San Juan chapter of The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris. It's a little glorious, but it's not overly romantic. Morris gives you a real description of some terrible, bad events that are going on with that San Juan battle, as well as good ones. For a look at how California's development, particularly San Francisco and its desire for growth and federal funds, increase the egg on for war, here's a good one. Imperial San Francisco. For an examination of the main incident that may have triggered the Spanish-American War, I'd read the investigation that happened years later. Admiral Hyman George Rickover is a famous Navy officer who had built the nuclear fleet for the United States. He conducted an investigation in the 1970s. He felt that the ship exploded, its engine had a mechanical failure, and it was not the result of the Spanish nor the Cuban rebels and that a mine would have been very difficult uh, to place in the Havana Harbor at that time. His book is How the Battleship Maine Was Destroyed, Hyman George Rickover. In my view, it's essential to know the Philippine War that resulted from the annexation of the Philippine Islands. So you have a good one here by Brian McAllister Lynn, The Philippine War, 1899-1902. to and for a view of the White House and McKinley's decision to go to war and to annex or not to annex the Philippines, you may want to read John Ford Rhodes' The McKinley and Roosevelt Administrations, 1897 to 1909. When would slavery had ended if the United States was still a colony of Britain? Well, you know, you got to look at this date, 1833, because that's when it was banned in Britain. But alt history is tough, and I think I'd make two points about the question. If the United States was still a colony because the revolution had failed, all slaves who fought with the British would be freed, creating a large, free, and protected population to lobby for future efforts. And the leverage of Southern slaveholders would have been reduced because they were allied, for the most part, with the Patriot cause. So punitive legislation may have been possible. Now, it's different if we're saying that the United States is still a colony because a revolution never happened at all. But it would be interesting to say how long, as a colony of Britain, slavery would have uh, survived with an activist abolitionist movement. While the United States abolitionists had to attempt to change things by appealing to Southerners and eventually mastering the Electoral College, which was not possible until 1860. All that the U.S. colonial abolitionists would have had to do is to get a boat to London faster than the Southern lobbyists and lobby Parliament better. It's hard to see a scenario where that doesn't happen faster than 1860, when you're talking about 30 years that it's been banned in Britain. It's a great one. A, uh, I'm very proud when I hear that a history teacher or a history professor is listening. And so history teacher named Jay Dumont asks me, if the events leading to the American Revolution, i.e. the Boston Massacre, Boston Tea Party, happened in a 21st century setting, what would rioters and picketers signs say? What I'm getting at in this question is, would the colonists have blamed the king, the parliament, or the home country as a collective? And would the home country have been known as England, Britain, or something else at the time? For background, I'm a middle school U.S. history teacher, and my kids are working on a creative writing project in which they give a first-person account of events. Well, here's the thing. If you picture a 21st century crowd and there's these people with Guy Fawkes faces on, I think uh, next... I think in their hands, you're going to see the following type of signs. All of these could have been seen back then. You don't do signs for a very simple reason. There's no photographs, nor are there TV cameras. <laughs> Here's what the signs might say. American rights before British greed. Parliament doesn't speak for me. North, Lord North, go to heck. Well, I wouldn't say heck. My country is Virginia. Hands off our ships. 
No murder act in this country. Connecticut won't pay for London's lards. Don't buy British. Kiss your local Sons of Liberty member. Maryland garments a rule. Soldiers taking our jobs, no. Drink coffee, good patriot. Long live the association. Parliament was the one deserving most of the citizens' particular ire, and the Guy Fawkes face would have been all over Parliament at the key problem. Lord North was seen as a, a tyrant, kind of being too close to the king, kind of trading the democratic government for favoritism from the monarch. He would have been an effigy target. Expect a sign about Washington and others called the Murder Act, the ability of British government to try colonials anywhere, including England or at sea. This was seen as the height of tyranny. Now, on the other hand, there are some people in Great Britain who would have earned some points from the colonists who were protesting. British Whigs like Edmund Burke or the Marquis of Rockingham, who supported American Parliament. They would have gotten thousands of likes on Facebook. In terms of terminology, yes, people were using the term American to describe British America in colonial times and American rights was the cry of the lead up to revolution. Before there was a real movement that this thing might come to arms, it was about American rights and about boycotting British goods. And they would have used the term Britain because the union had occurred, Scotland and England. Each colony had a different relationship. So it gets different with every state. So you look at Pennsylvania, that's a very strong charter where King Charles gave to William Penn, you know, an absolute right to run that colony. It made it almost independent. Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, they were operating already, and by the time you get to 1775, with very little concern for British authority. And throughout their history, the New England region had been the first to kind of shake off the British role. You know, during the English Civil War, Connecticut sent a boat, like 100 fighters, back to England to go fight the king. New York, New Jersey, Delaware, they had a little bit more loyalist feeling. Boycotting of goods, more than just tea, would have played a big role in any signage or protest. And there was a bit of a preference for coffee. Not only was it taking off at the same time as a beverage, but it did have that little hint of American patriotism. Sam Adams and many other patriot planners in Philadelphia would drink mugs of the heavy, muddy stuff while planning. And it seemed like the more radical people were, you know, pain and Adams and some of the others, the more coffee they drank. Maybe that has something to do with the revolution. Uh, David Kenny again. Assuming a Democratic president is elected in 2016, given the way the states line up, could we see both a Republican elected president and the Democrats retaking the Senate? Unlikely, in my view. Could we see both a Republican narrowly elected president and the Democrats retaking the Senate? Democratic president, Democratic Senate, Republican House. I can see Democratic president, Republican Senate, Republican House. I can see Republican president, Republican Senate, Republican House run the table. All those seem like possibilities. That particular one doesn't seem likely. Usually you need a bit more motor to pull down ticket candidates upward during a presidential election. This is going to be the main thing that voters are focused on. All right. In the current election, there's a lot about these individual Senate races and the candidates and the like. The number one reason on most voters' mind, remember, you're going to get an enlarged turnout, you're going to maybe as much as 25% in this presidential election, the thing on those voters' minds is the presidential elections. You're going to need them to pull the ticket up, and it would be very unlikely to see where the Democratic candidate doesn't succeed, and yet their Senate candidates do. I think if Democrats are winning the Senate, that means they're getting the turnout to also win the presidential election. Look where the Senate races are in 2016. They're in a lot of swing presidential states. Colorado, Ohio, Wisconsin, Nevada, New Hampshire, Florida. The interesting thing is you have Colorado, there's the only Senate race of those I mentioned where the Democrats actually leading. So in Ohio, Florida, Wisconsin, you have current senators that are, according to Cook, I'll, I'll use Cook political report, right now likely to win their seats. Now that's going to change, of course, when there's an election. But that just goes to show you that if anything, there's a little bit... Uh, 
reason to be worried about if you're the Democratic National Committee looking at the 2016 election in terms of the Senate seats. So your presidential ticket is going to have to be outstanding to carry those candidates up and to beat incumbents in those states. That they would be able to best those Republican incumbents say that they're going to beat Mark Rubio in Florida and Ron Johnson in Wisconsin, but lose in the presidential races in those states? Not likely, in my opinion. Should the legality of marijuana use be a matter of constitutional amendment? It's an interesting question. I mean, um, the one thing I will say is if you do that, and this is probably not well understood, such an amendment would actually elevate marijuana use above alcohol because there is no amendment or federal or constitutional right to drink. Now, you might think that there is because of the 21st Amendment, which repealed prohibition. But here's what the prohibition says in Section 2. The transportation or importation into any state, territory, or possession of the United States for delivery or use therein of intoxicating liquors in violation of the laws thereof is hereby prohibited. So (laughs) what it's actually doing is... It repeals prohibition in Section 1, repeals the 18th Amendment. But then in Section 2, gets harsh and says every state has the right to control it. And it prohibits importing liquor into a state that doesn't think it should be there. Or that has set up a system of laws that you're not following. That innocuous, innocent rights granting 21st, everybody celebrate beer legal drink beer, you know, all of that, actually has as one of its major components a restriction. Uh, This is because while prohibition got out of hand, as we know, so did absolute free consumption and sale of alcohol in many minds. And the particular problem at the time that really led to prohibition was the appearance of a large number of unregulated saloons could be a precedent for how to proceed with any new drugs that majorities wish to legalize for recreational and freedom purposes. I mean, if there was a 28th Amendment allowing states to regulate drugs, it might be a better goal to do it in this form of the Section 2, hand it over to the states to decide on how that they will regulate or what laws they will impose. Constitutional right can be a powerful thing, so there will It'll be difficult for any state to ever regulate the use of of any drug that you legalize under a constitutional amendment. Would Joe Ford have won the 1976 U.S. presidential election if he had not pardoned Richard Nixon in September 1974? And was Ford right to do it regardless what it cost him? Well, I've looked at 1976. It was quite an interesting election. It was two surprise candidates that two years before, no one would have named as candidates. Jimmy Carter was an unknown governor from Georgia, and Gerald Ford was in the House of Representatives and no intention to run for president. Two years later, they're battling for the presidency. So I think it was an interesting election. There wasn't a lot of loyalty with either side. They were both new, untried people, and they both had their weaknesses. My kind of feeling about the 76 election, to use an example from, it's like the movie Rocky II, where Rocky Balboa and Apollo Creed are battling and battling, and at the end it just is a matter of who, in the end, is able to get up after taking a beating in the last round. So it's a tight, close election, probably one of the closest elections that we've ever had. Carter gets just 50% of the popular vote to win. When Gerald Ford takes over, August 1974, now this is healing moment for the nation. He says, our long national nightmare is over. He starts with a 71% approval rating. Upon the issuance of the pardon of Nixon, the very next month, it drops to 50%. 
a key staff member of him resigns. Media starts criticizing Ford. The Congress calls hearings. It's bad. He never gets his approval rating back up anywhere near where it started. And in the next year, it's going to go down into the 30s. On the other hand, he kind of gets some distance from the pardon, too, by the time you're getting to that 1976 election. When Congress calls hearings, he is one of the first. I mean, Lincoln appeared at some congressional committees. He's one of the first presidents to ever go into Congress and testify publicly in front of an active committee. And he testifies about the pardon. He gets some distance on it. I don't think the actual pardon. In other words, people actually thinking there was some kind of a deal between Nixon and Ford is an issue in 1976. The real issue comes down to Ford's performance and a few other things we'll talk about. In 1975, he has really rough economy. Inflation is bad. On the other hand, GDP growth gets fairly good in 1976. 50% of people in 1976 say the country is on the right track. Now, to put that in perspective, that's pretty good for Ford because when Democrats take over the White House from Republicans in 1992 and 2008, they need 75% of people to say the country's on the wrong track when they're doing that, 1992 and 2008. Here, in 1976, 50% of people are saying it's on the right track. So, easy to make the case that absent the pardon of Nixon, you have a Ford win. In fact, Carter himself later says... That without that pardon of Nixon, he wouldn't have won the election. Now, that should settle it, right? But I don't think it does. Because I think there are a couple of other factors. Ford was unelected. He never sealed the deal, I think. You know, he wasn't even elected on a national ticket. He was appointed by the Congress to be vice president and then became president when Nixon resigned. It didn't feel like he was the incumbent. I think if you look at that 71% that he got, a lot of that's coming out of the fact that Ford is seen as a non-politician in a time when people are angry about what happened with Nixon and Watergate and politics generally. But the minute he announces that he's going to run for re-election, he becomes like any other politician. And secondly, Ronald Reagan challenges him in the primary. It's a ferocious primary. It goes all the way to the convention in Kansas City. It's bitter between moderates and conservative supporters of the incumbent president and Reagan's insurgents. If voters didn't think that Ford was a real incumbent beforehand, now you got someone in his own party challenging him. On the other hand, Carter has a unified party. He has an attractive message in the time of Watergate when people were bitter about politics. He's a one-term governor of Georgia. He's outside of Washington. Another factor that's not looked at. Carter, in that 1976 election, is very much a favorite son of the South. We haven't had a deep South president in a long time. He takes the region 54 to 45 over Ford. He wins Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina. No Democrat has done that since. You can't even imagine that. He pulls the party back from the disaster that was 1972. He wins 29% of conservatives in that 76 election. No Democratic candidate. Nobody gets that high a number among conservatives again running as a Democrat. He ties among male voters, which only Clinton in 1992 and Obama in 2008 are able to beat. He stumbles as a candidate, and he does this disastrous interview for some reason, decides to do an interview with Playboy magazine, and then says that he has lusted in his heart for other women. It's just... He was trying to do something like being a little bit different type of candidate, and that didn't work out so well. Has a very poor performance in the first debate, doesn't look presidential against Ford. So I think the closest to the election were related to his stumbles. He got back on track. 43% of the people in the 1976 election and exit polls, when they're asked what's the most important issue, they say inflation. But the main point is this. You can take away Ford's pardon of Nixon, but you can't take away is the memory of Watergate, which was so palpable for voters at that time. And they were going to punish the GOP party, in my opinion. Either way, they punished the party in the midterms of 
1974, when Nixon also isn't on the ballot. And I think they were going to punish Ford either way. Would have been a close election. Think Carter wins that in any case. But we'll never know. As to the pardon, whether it was the right thing or the wrong thing to do, you know, Ford ends up winning a Profile of Courage Award from the Kennedy, you know, which is run by the Kennedy family for his pardon of Nixon. Both Woodward and Bernstein come out and, and, and agree years later that it was the right thing to do to just get the country moving. You know, if we were just spending more and more time, 74, 75, talking about Watergate, the economy needed improvement. There was a consolidation of power again in the Soviet Union under Brezhnev, who was getting stronger, and they were starting to get more aggressive. It was, you know, it was a moment for U.S.-Soviet relations there where we we either going to start some missile conferences or both sides were going to get aggressive. I think that's what was operating in Ford's mind. I also think he was concerned about Nixon and concerned about the Nixon family. He was in contact, I believe, with the family. They worried about Nixon's condition, I mean, mentally, um, and what might have happened there. So the sight for America of a president being put on trial might have been too much. On the other hand, I, I kind of have a middle view about that, the pardon issue. Has it excused the action of other presidents. I don't know. I'm not, I, I hear that a lot. Has it said the Nixon pardon set a precedent for other presidents that they can do whatever they want? Maybe. Although if I were a president today, I wouldn't be so sure I'd be getting a pardon from a future occupant of the White House. So it might have been a little bit of a precedent, but I don't think it's a guarantee. Do you think maybe the pardon was a little extensive? He pardoned Nixon for any crimes he committed or any crimes that he might have committed. And I wonder if it should have been a more focused pardon just related specifically to the cover-up regarding Watergate. I also wonder if he should have sweated him out a bit and not done it in the second month of his presidency. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. We've got an offer for the archive, 1888. Uh, if you're interested in that, we have a lot of episodes going back to 2006, which you'll have access to. One of thanks to those who purchased, and a happy 2015 to all. Thanks for listening.